Welcome to the keynote session, EO at the Edge. I'm Brian Killow from NASA, and I lead the CIOS Systems Engineering Office. I'll be facilitating this session, so let's jump in. Our session theme, EO at the Edge, will explore how Earth observation data is being used in new and innovative ways and what we see for the future. I'll kick off this session with a short presentation followed by five other presentations from our guest speakers and then we will end with a 45-minute panel discussion. I thought I would share some news and innovations from the CIOS world, a few things that uh, we have accomplished recently and many of you may not know what's happening. Uh, there's a number of regional cubes that are in discussion and development. Uh, many of you know about Digital Earth Africa but we're also working in the Americas, Digital Earth Americas, and in the Pacific Islands, Digital Earth Pacific. And you see our icons over there to the right, and all of these things are coming along quite nicely with our aim of someday having regional data cubes around the world. There's also been a lot of progress in analysis-ready data. There is a CIOS analysis-ready data for land specification called card Pharrell that you may have heard about. And we have had a number of new specifications that are in development, such as aquatic reflectance, nightlight radiance, and interferometric and polarimetric radar, as well as LIDAR. It's our hope that many of these specifications will come together and be approved within the year, and we will have uh, quite an extensive list of card Pharrell specs. Uh, there's also a number of new cloud providers that are hosting CIOS data sets. Um, most recently, Microsoft Azure Cloud and the Planetary Computer, they're coming on board with many of the same large data sets that we're used to using, and you're going to probably hear more from them uh, in the near future. I always get a number of unexpected inquiries about the Open Data Cube. And I just wanted to let all of you know what some of these inquiries are, where they're coming from, because I really always find them quite interesting. Uh, I've had a number from student researchers that just asked to use Open Data Cube for their uh, research or their projects. I was contacted by the Norwegian Computing Center. Uh, also, there's a Ernst & Young EY Student Challenge that is happening in Australia, and I've been partnering with Geoscience Australia to help them move that forward. Been contacted by the German Aerospace Center. Uh, just a few weeks ago, there uh, was contacted by a group called Air Center in the Azores, and they are producing an Azores data cube. Spark Geo. Uh, IM Map is working in the Middle East. The UN World Food Program has contacted us directly about Digital Earth Pacific. And then most recently, just this past week, I was involved in a conference called Earth Archive, which is an attempt to create a digital elevation model, uh, three-dimensional uh, digital elevation model of the Earth, uh, what they call a digital twin and storing that data in voxel maps, which are uh, basically three-dimensional pixels. And then finally, I wanted to mention that we've developed a new Open Data Cube sandbox that utilizes Google Colab and Google Earth Engine. And I'll tell you a bit more about that on the next chart. We're really excited about the new Open Data Cube sandbox. Uh, you can find the link there, openearthalliance.org slash sandbox, to go uh, check it out on, on your own. It runs on Google Colab. So it's free and open, notebook interface. It connects to Google Earth Engine data sets, and we've indexed uh, a number of the, the big data sets like Landsat, Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2. And you can create sample application products and run them anywhere in the world without the need to download data. The, the key to this is that it's free, it's open, and you can uh, run immediately Jupyter Notebooks. 
Now there is one catch, and that is you need a Google account. So if you just have a Google email, Gmail address, that's perfectly fine. And then you need Earth Engine authorization. So if you go to the Sandbox link, you will see information on how to apply for Earth Engine authorization. It's a rather simple step, and sometimes it just takes uh, a matter of uh, minutes uh, or an hour or sometimes a day or two depending upon uh, the email address you use. This Google Colab environment is small. It includes about 12 gigabytes of RAM and about 100 gig of storage. So when you spin it up and, and initialize it, it gives you your own dedicated instance. If you, and you can do a number of analyses there and demonstrate notebooks it's really fantastic for the potential for uh, training and capacity building. But if you want to run larger analyses and you want to scale this up, you're going to have to move it to Google Cloud uh, to take advantage of the Earth Engine data sets. So what we've done is we've created a number of sample applications or sample notebooks that we have ready to run for users. So we have cloud statistics for Landsat 8 and Sentinel 2. It basically looks at a stack of scenes and you can go through those scenes and get cloud statistics and look at the images. Spectral products, you can create cloud filtered mosaics and even download and save the mosaic uh, locally. Vegetation change, water extent using the WAFS algorithm from Australia, vegetation phenology, nighttime lights using the VIRS instrument, mission coincidences, which is real interesting and that is when does Landsat 8, Sentinel-1, or Sentinel-2 cross over simultaneously in any location? And then finally, we have a notebook dedicated to Sentinel-1 radar products. So all of these run on this platform that is managed by Google, and CoLab is the environment that runs the Jupyter Notebook. So it's really fantastic. Uh, I urge you all to go check it out and uh, we'll be making some updates in the next week or two because we'll be demoing this for the upcoming GEO meeting. So finally I wanted to end with a few thoughts on what we see for the future. Um, certainly more regional and local data cubes around the world. They seem to be popping up all of the time. Certainly when I say local I, I probably mean more country level data cubes. And then uh, I told you a bit earlier about the regional initiatives. In general, I'm seeing broad open data cube adoption by governments and commercial entities around the world. I think it's fantastic that the efforts of this open data cube community have benefited so many people in, in having more efficient and effective access to data. And, and so, Along those lines, faster and more efficient applications, we're noticing that uh, a lot of our notebooks are using Dask now, we're using parallel processing and machine learning. I think all of these ideas uh, for our applications are going to be more popular. Python proficiency is also increasing around the globe. Uh, I just personally com completed a, a Python class in this past week so that I could become a bit better with my skills. And we're, uh, we're managing a few training sessions within the CIOS world uh, through the working group on capacity building to do a large scale training event for um, Python. So it's really exciting to see that more people are stepping up to learning how to use this and it, it makes uh, the ability to run our notebooks and use our satellite data so much easier. The standardization of metadata and stack format is something I, I believe is taking hold and it's going to ultimately eliminate the need for ODC indexing if we can uh, get everything to be into stack metadata format. I'm also seeing a number of diverse data sets that want to have the ability to utilize Open Data Cube framework. Uh, there's some work going on with drones, uh, analytical mechanics, and the group I work with here uh, has been piloting some drone data integrated with Open Data Cube. Uh, I'm working with the voxel map people on the Earth Archive project for 3D voxels 
And then, of course, there's Internet, or Internet of Things, which would give us the ability to take data from small devices and store that in Open Data Cube frameworks. And then finally, interoperable analyses that use multiple and diverse data sets. There's not many of those things happening, but I believe that is also the wave of the future, is bringing together all of these diverse data sets for the objective of a given uh, output product. And that's where the power uh, of some of the computing and some of the uh, interesting concepts will come together. So thank you for that brief introduction. Uh, as always, please check out the Open Data Cube website. We have a Twitter account. And if you want to see more about the Google Sandbox that I discussed, go to openearthalliance.org slash sandbox. Thank you.